Welcome to the UK OCR Community Podcast, presented by Obstacle Racing Media. Each episode, we'll be talking to race directors, elite runners, weekend warriors, and frankly, anyone else from the UK OCR scene that will talk to us. Here is your host, Alan, aka Muddy Duck. Anywhere in Chicken South. The bloody scene is bloody sad. The bloody news is bloody bad. Bloody... Greetings, friends, acquaintances, and anyone else for stopping listening. How's everyone's weekend? If I sound a bit funny, it's because I feel a bit funny today. So, I've hurt my back. Proper, proper hurt my back. So anyone who saw me at weekend at Total Warrior knows exactly I can't walk, I can't move, I'm really, really struggling. And I don't know how I've done it. I'm, I'm really bad. So, but I'm not going to dwell on it, I'm going to try and move on. But if I do sound funny, it's because whenever I ever move on my, my office chair, I get a little bit of pain. So, um, I hope everyone's weekend's been really, really well. As I said, I went to a Total Warrior. Uh, didn't do no filming. I wanted to do some filming. Um, and I got the bike out uh, to do some filming. And I realised I couldn't ride it with my back. So I asked Harley, my son, if he'd go out. He did a bit of filming for me. Will Chung did some filming for me. Libby Joyce did some filming for me. So it's all going to come out this week. Hopefully this week, UK OCR series, Total Warrior race. If I can sit down and edit it. And I mean, do mean that. If I can sit down and edit it... Um, Gonna go into some saunering and things like that, try and get me back right. Um, but that's me. I hope you had a good weekend. You went Total Warrior, I hope you really enjoyed it. it. Looked like an amazing race. I've not done Total Warrior in about three, no, so since pre COVID, I'd missed the one pre COVID. Um, and it's changed a lot, you know, they've got a slide now that goes into an actual pool, pond, whatever you want to call it at the bottom. They've got another couple of obstacles where you're going to water, coming up a slippery bank with a cargo net above you. Um, got the high jump, which I've done the high jump before, which is quite good. Um, and yeah, but yeah, they're absolutely amazing. Loved it, loved it. Loved Total Warrior. Um, really, really good. Didn't get to see a great deal of the course. Really, really missed not running. Um, would have loved to have run. But we've got some good footage. We've got some good interviews. Um, and those are coming up this week. Um, but because I've been struggling... With my back, and I've, I've said I wasn't going to mention it earlier, but I am struggling with my back. Um, I've had to dig in the de- in the archives for this episode because I really can't sit down for an hour, an hour and a half to edit it. Um, so I want to just talk for two or three minutes and then put an, put one in. So this is um, Joss Naylor. Joss Naylor. Now I released it a while ago, pre Christmas, and after literally fifteen listens, I pulled it. So within half an hour of me releasing it, I pulled it. The reason being that Josh got taken into hospital. And, yeah, I, d- I didn't want to release it because we didn't know what was going to happen to him. Um, he's recovering. He's recovering really, really well. So I thought, now's the time to release it. Now's a good time to release it. I didn't want to release it after something's happened to him because that would be wrong. So I thought, let's get it out. Let's get it out there. Let's get people listening to it. Um, and to get people into fell running. You know, because I, I love a bit of fell running. I love going up the mills. Um, and I was talking to a few people at weekend who, who live in London and they've been doing a fell race. There's an actual fell race in London, the flyest part of the world, or one of the flyest parts, and yeah, they've been doing fell race in there. And a Category A as well, which was absolutely amazing. Um, I forgot the name of it, but I'm sure we'll talk about it on the Swift Dive at some point. Um, so anyway, here it is, Joss Naylor, recorded it late last year, 2021, just pre-Christmas. Um, so... Have a listen. Tell me what you think afterwards. Thank you for joining us today, Joss Naylor. It's a pleasure to have someone of your running calibre on the UK OCR podcast. Well, it's nice to be here. <laughs> this is sitting there nice and dry. It's not like outside in the Lake District where it's uh, going through a bad patch at the moment. Is it a bad patch, though, or is it just the normal rain that you get in the Lake District? Well, it's becoming that way. It's... Uh, this last uh, couple of months, it's gradually got worse. The days are getting shorter and blacker, and the rain seems as though it's getting heavier. <laughs> You'll be used to rain, though, being being outside, being a farmer all your life, you know, with, with a sheep yeah, and things right. like that. Aye. Well, our skins don't turn water very well, though, when you get older. <laughs> what was... Um... You know, when you was growing up and that, and you was like on the farm, you know, what was it like working on a farm? Because I mean, I've, I live in the middle of a town centre, so 
Um, I'm sure uh, our listeners would want to know what it was like working on a sheep farm. Like when uh, I was being brought up, like, you know, 1939, I can remember that big flood that in 1939, it was disgusting. It did a lot of damage in the Lake District. It took quite a few bridges out and, uh, you know, washed a lot of the rivers out as well, like, you know, and especially on our, our side of the Lake District. And then uh, in 1940, 41, we had a big snow. And we don't get them sort of snows anymore, like, you know, that one, it uh, wasted a lot of sheep and filled all the lanes in that a big broad oak out for about six weeks down at uh, Bootle, you know. And we had, don't get them sort of snows anymore, like, you know. 1947, we had another bad winter. It set, continued for about six weeks with real hard frost and, you know, it hung with the sheep more than anything in that, that one, like, because it lasted so long. And then uh, in 1963, when there's no football for six weeks, that'll be more than your time of life. Yeah. You'd be kicking the ball about then, like. Oh, definitely. That, that one lasted quite a long time, because there's no, no football for about six weeks. So you'll remember that one if you're on the go. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I played football, Joss, the moment it rained, it gets called off. You know, that's that's what it's like this day and age. It's not like when you played with the, the leather cases and and that. Uh, and all laced up ball, if you got that across your forehead, you knew you took it <laughs> off it. <laughs> Those but stitches, you, yeah. <laughs> we used to play in a pair of clocks, like, you know, it uh, took a bit of leather off the ball if you got miskicked it, like. <laughs> my, my, but, you know, you, you don't go up. At about half a half inch of blood and water on them, you know. It was hard work playing. You'd kick ball and it would maybe go about 20 yards and it would stop in the puddle. <laughs> up, up the scratch in them days. Yeah. That, that was when it was very much um, weather was weather back then, wasn't it? You know, because now we talk about weather. I mean, I, I live in Yorkshire, but I live a little bit lower down than you. I live in Barnsley area. And uh, where we are, it's very, it's very mild all year. You know, we don't get the snow and we don't get the rain and we don't get the, you know, the sunlight. Usually it just seems to be every month stays the same. Aye, uh, so you get the continuous weather right throughout. There's no springs and autumns and summers anymore. Yeah, there isn't. You know, when you was growing up and, you know, we had, we had proper seasons, did you... You know, we just talked about the floods and you got the snow and you got all of that type of stuff. Did you actually, when you was running, did you time your runs for certain seasons? You know, did you, or did you just run it all year, whatever the weather was? Well, it, I used to train most on wet days because I couldn't get on the work when I was farming. Like, you know, if it was a real bad day, I'd maybe go for a run around the lake, which was about 20 or 30 miles, like, you know, you know, I'd get a good, good run in then because you had to think about getting home and getting your work done because you, couldn't get on with it maybe for three or four hours, like, you know. So <laughs> when it rained, I could do something about it. That's, that's a whole different life today, isn't it? Because today, if it rains, and run, not a good, I no won't say a good runner or normal, but most runners, the moment it rains, that's it. I'm not going for a run. I'm going to wait until it, you know, it, it, uh, it clears up. But you was out there. I got out there. It was the only chance I got, you know. If it was fun and sunny, I had other jobs to do, and it had to be done, because when you're a one-man band, you couldn't just to go for a run where you wanted to. You had to go for a run you couldn't do anything else. <laughs> was, was you, as a school child, was you into sport? I used to play football and that, like, you know, but uh, there was very little running in them days, like, you know. What, what position did you play? Fullback. Oh, they had a big clogs on. <laughs> <laughs> the one who puts the big tackles in. <laughs> I, I used to knock legs from them. I got past it. And then I used to get set, set up for fouling. Right. And what got, when, at what point did you get into running then? Oh, when I was uh, in, my, in, in the early 20s, uh, you know, when I was young and had a bad back, like, you know, but it didn't stop us from working on that. You had to work in them days. You never got any days off because you were lame or anything like that. No, there was none of this um, 
benefits there like no, there are now, was there? There was no sick notes in them days. <laughs> what was it? Um, did, you, did your dad just like mine? He turned around and said, I've got a bit of a cold. He, he clipped me around here and said, get to work. It's only a sniffle. Uh, yeah, you had to get out of bed in the morning, whatever, whatever the situation was. I mean, you entered your first mountain trail run, um, age 24. Uh, uh, 1960. Uh, 1960 it was. What was that like entering your first race? Oh, it was all right. I really enjoyed it. Like, you know, I got a, got cramped bad and that was, but that was with not running a pair of big boots on, you know. When you're having yourself and you hadn't run before and you had a pair of big boots on. But was you running up against all these other fell runners with proper trainers then and you were just there in your in your work boots? Well, I was with them, you know, for a big, bigger half of the race. I sat in the lead, more or less. And then I got cramped really bad, you know, like a salt as well, like, you know, probably. It was quite a, quite a warm day. Yeah. Did, did you, talking about lack of salt and that, did you know anything about nutrition back then or was it just, because, I mean, I've, oh. I've seen your blog and you run with jam sandwiches rather than, like, gels and things like that. You know, what, what was uh, your... Uh, I never had any nutrition. <laughs> we never, never knew a word like that in our day. So was it trial and error? Was it very much trial and error? Uh, a lot of it, I think so. Uh, when I was looking at it, they had, they had plenty of ability if I had time to really train and put the time in. Yeah. I, I mean, from, from my research, from Ian, thank you for these, by the way, so I've got a research, researcher in. East tells me that, at the third checkpoint, you were actually in the lead at the third checkpoint. You've got boots on. These have got running shoes on. You know, you've uh, got the cramp. You know, you, you decide to pull out. But you went back the next year? Uh, I went finished that year, like, you know. I finished uh, about 16th overall. But when I got some salt into me about an hour further on, the cramp really went like, you know, a lot of it was just through lack of body salts, I would think. Yeah. Did, did did that then give you the bug? But was that the bug to go on and do greater things? Uh, I think it was like you know, uh, but what? I had an idea you know, that the old uh, consultant told us I was a born athlete. I had all the credentials of of had a pair of lungs like uh, the cyclist, and uh, it was only a very few people who had big lungs like I have. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've read that as well on some of the some of the documentaries and that um, that your lungs are taking a lot of air and this absorb a lot of oxygen um, and that in your blood bloodstream. Ah, uh, that was a, you know, a good thing, really. She never never really got out of breath. It was you know you could run very relaxed. You know when you're pushing yourself. Yeah. How did you manage to actually find time to to run? You know, running a farm full time, being a that that was your job, your livelihood, you know, your life. How did you find time to actually go and run? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't run, run many races because I hadn't time to go and run them. Some of them I never trained for. I just, you know, I maybe never had a run for a fortnight or something like that. I had time to just run when I had the opportunity, really. And what did the other runners think when you used to rock up? Was was they fearful of you? Know, you know, let's just say a year down the line, you rocked up, you won a few races. Uh, were they getting fearful of you? In the early days, I guess to get a bit of a stick. There's one or two blokes who were really jealous and they were, you know, rather officious, like you know. But uh, they're with us no longer. And and, and what? Well, did they help you out? Did they did they help you to, to get better and with the kit and things like that? They would have banned you if they could. <laughs> they would have banned you. I like that. I like that. Um, so when did you get into actually doing, instead of the races, at what point did you think, right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to smash the Bob Graham or, you know, I'm going to do the, the Wainwrights and things like that. At what point did you change from racing to, this, to the challenge side of things? Oh, it would be, let's think, Round about the uh, later, later 60s, early 70s. Yeah, it was about the time. Uh, and, and what was your thought process behind that? Was it a case of you were getting bored winning races? You wanted the whole new challenge? Was it you wanted to push uh, your body? Just as the other side of our sport, like, you know, 
like the ball game, it sort of opened things up for people to do longer things. And it was, you know, there for other things to be created, like, you know, like so a lot of the longer runs I did, like over the lifetime. Did you, when you went and did the Bob Graham, um, did you actually, 75 is when you wrote the 24-hour record. Did, did you go and, did you plan it? How much planning was put into that? Well, very little. Because me, one of my friends, he did a bit of the groundwork because it was a busy time. I hadn't really much time to train then. Because, you know, I had a lot of sheep on and a lot of work, you know, to do. And my, I had a brother who was starting up in, on at least two brothers who were starting up farming, and I used to help both of them out as well, like, you know. Around about that time, it was teddy picking time. You know, maybe have two ton of teddies to pick in the morning before dinner time to get on the teddy wagon. And then uh, you'd have your own work to do as well. Training, were, running, that wasn't on the schedule. And if you wanted to do a longer run, well, you know, you were relying on a wet day. Or someone else doing the groundwork for you. So, so, so what, what was what was the whole plan when you went out? Did, did you was it like two weeks' notice, did, or did you plan it a little bit longer? What what was it? Well, you planned a day, and you, if the mist was down to the foul bottoms and it was raining, you went and did it. You know, you didn't alter your plans. And, and what was the weather like on that day? Well, when we did the seventy-two peaks. It, it was red hot. I when, when I did the 60, it uh, rained all, you know, for 24 hours and the 60 peaks. And when I did the 63 peaks, you no, know, I did 61, didn't I? And then 63. And the 63 peaks, it rained for 24 hours when I did that one. The mist was down to about, you know, three or 400 feet. And it's just a continuous flood. Did you do any? Reconnaissance runs, did you go out and do any reconnaissance? I mean, you, I know you live up around that area, but did, had you run all the routes before or? No, not, well, I, I had an idea whether, you know, the, of the ground, like, but uh, I had a chap who used to do a lot of running with us at that time. And, uh, you know, he was a fit lad. He, you know, did the, the routes and, uh, you know, he had all the covers bands worked out where we were going, like, you know, and, uh, he did a, you know, a large percentage of the run with me at different times. I know we did the 63, it was one point we couldn't find Sergeant Mann for about 25 minutes. It was pitch black and it was blowing a gale and rain was coming down the stair rods. And uh, we would, we must have been the top of it three times and we, we weren't sure it was it. You know, it was just so bad a day. You just could not believe it. I mean, I mean, that, was like, that was about half past four in the morning, anyways. I, I like the idea. This, I, I talk about this quite a lot about the fell running community. Um, and I spoke to some people who did the three peaks, you know, the wow. um, Ben Nevis, Scaffold, and, and Snowdonia not long since. And they wasn't sure whether they did Scaffold um, overnight. So they actually went up the next morning and re ran Scaffold Pike. And, I, and this is very much like like you just said there. You couldn't find the top. You wasn't sure. You spent 25 minutes because you want to be 100. No one would have ever have known, but you want to be 100% certain you've done it right, don't you? Oh, you do. I, like I know, and I did the three peaks your record. It was in 1972. I did it with Frank Davis, like, you know, and that night when I went to Ben, ben Nevis, the snow, uh, the mist was down to 500 feet. And the rain was coming down in stair rods. But at that time of the year, the, the rain was warm, like. And that night in particular, there was no gale force winds. And when you come into the Lake District, there'd been uh, violent thunderstorms. And going up Grain Gill, it was like running in the oven, like, you know. The sweat was running down your legs. I, uh, when you did the three peaks, the part I like about it was... Frank was driving a, um, a, a, a rally specification Ford Capri. Uh, Am I right? Uh, an old white, it was a white one. And there's one on this side now, the same car. It's just sods low. I say it every day when I pass it like it's just parked out in front of this house. Right. An old white Ford Capri brings back great memories. 
<laughs> Did, uh, how, how, what was it like? Did you get to sleep in between? Because I can imagine, you know, <laughs> Frank British. flying down the roads. <laughs> it was just wondering whether you're going to keep on the road or not. <laughs> I'd gone, gone down Scot through Scotland, like, you know, there wasn't the motorways or anything then. And we met the wagons coming off the ferry, and it was absolutely storming. And when you're passing down, the old crepe was swinging its back end a bit, I can tell you. When you're passing a big wagon on about 18 inches off it, and you're doing about 100 miles an hour, it's a different ball game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no speed cameras back then, you know, but I, I would have thought that 100 mile an hour in a rally specification uh, for Capri, the police wouldn't have just let you go anyway. <laughs> well, there would have been bad. It wouldn't be out a night like that. <laughs> I was just a bad patch going through Scotland, like, you know, just, you know, with the storm. When we got in the Lake District, you know, the thunder and that had gone, like, you know, just the after effects were so humid. And what, and what about Snowdonia? Did you go up the side of the railway or did you take one of the I other ran, routes? I ran up the railway line and back down it because uh, I didn't want to get lost because the mist was right down into uh, Snowdonia, like into Lamberis. Snow, Lamberis. Yeah. I... And uh, the 14, 3,000 foot peaks were looking out of the uh, mist. It was like a sea of islands and little blue sky above. Oh, wow. Uh, it was just, just a miracle. Wow. Uh, it was something very, very special. That, that, I mean, to know that you, you broke the record and to see something like that, you know, it's, it's just a win-win situation, isn't it? You know, it's... Uh, you know, you'd... You thought you'd never ever have seen that again. And I think it was about two years after I was running a two-day marathon down in uh, Snowden area. And we went over the glitters and we come over the highest point and you could see the 14, 3,000 foot peaks looking out of the sea of white mist again. <laughs> that was just so slow, you know. It's very rare anybody ever gets a chance to see it once, let alone twice in two times up and sort of thing. Wow. Wow, that's a. I like the whole idea. You a couple of weeks later, you go and do a two a two day race when you've just run the three peaks in in sub twenty four. Uh, I that's I took twelve hours. You know, we were under twelve hours when we did this that record. It never got beat. No, it, it doesn't. I mean, your records have they've stood for a long time, haven't they? You know, the seventy two peaks that you broke in seventy five that stood for thirteen years. You know. Uh, but, you know, that day, if things had been set up and, you know, I could have done a few more that day because I did things wrong, like, you know, when you look back and what you, how you did it, now it should have been done. There's all this, a lot of research been done into these things, you know, over the years. What, what's, what's your thoughts on the technology behind some of these attempts now, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, someone's got to run it, but there does seem to be a lot more technology behind it rather than where, when you did it, you rocked up, like you said, on whatever day, whatever weather was there. You rocked up, you did it, you you know, you you smashed it. Now there's a lot of technology looking at um, weather, you know, weather three, four months ahead, you know, will the weather be right? Is the route right? What's the best nutrition? I uh, Well, look at, on the nutrition side, like, you know, there's been a tremendous lot done on these gels and stuff, but, you know, the things I've never ever bothered about, like, you know, I just went and did the run and, you know, Maybe an egg sandwich or something, that was it. <laughs> I like that nutrition. Egg sandwich and jam sandwich, it's the best nutrition ever. I'm going to have to um, give it a go. <laughs> uh, if you can't get by on them, you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and you are also, I mean, I mean, you've run through a lot of injuries, haven't you? you know, uh, in your time. What's the worst injury you've had? I think, well, apart from me back there, what, just take I apart from my back, you know, which I, I got it knocked up oh, really badly in uh, 1958 50, it was. I had I about uh, let's think about eight months when I could really fly. Like you know, everything was going for us, and it had been a wet day, and I was jumping this wire fence. And my hand slipped off the post and I landed on a little stone looking out of the uh, ground and it went in my back where I'd been operated on. 
and that's what wrecked us really. You know, I never, never was the same again. You know, but then, that eight months, I know it was up a lambing time, and you know, I could catch sheep anywhere without a dog. I had that little bit of speed out of my block sort of thing. It was just absolute magic. Right. And uh, then when I was in this straight jack for about eight weeks, when I come back out of it, I was supposed to get uh, physio treatment and I never got any. I went to see the doctor on the Monday morning and he just gave a note to start work. I never got any <laughs> physio or anything, which I should have had, like, you know. Yeah. And, uh, it took us a while to get over that again. And uh, I had one or two bad accidents, you know, when I was cycling in Spain. And uh, at the finish, I gave up cycling. I just had no luck, like, you know. Was you, was you any good at cycling? I was all right. I was, you know, I was quite strong, like, you know, I could climb on, climb on a bike. I was a good, you know, I just, I used to go out with a quite a big, strong team, like, you know. At the end of the day, I was always with them, like, you know, there was, I, they couldn't get away from us, you know. But when I, you know, when I'd done quite a bit of it, like, my climbing was good and the leg, leg, leg power was okay. I think, I think someone wants you. Do you want to answer it? I don't mind stopping and we'll... I'll answer it. Yeah, that's it. See, it's was that another scam phone call? Was that one of them phone calls where you press one to answer it? Oh, somebody wanting us. <laughs> you're, you're a well-wanted person, Josh. That's the thing. Everyone wants a piece of you. I... I'm going to have to cut Michelle up in the bloody bitch for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about people wanting you. One of the, one of the things I love about, about you, Joss, is when I see people like Nikki, uh, Nikki Spinks and the other runners going up and doing these challenges up in the lakes, the, you're always there to cheer them on and, and that, you know. But what's, what's that like, seeing people attempting to break your records and sometimes doing it? Oh, it's great. I, you know, that's... I didn't put it up you know, for the enjoyment and they're getting pleasure out of it. And that's all I want, to see these people doing them. And if I can be out and see them, it's great. Yeah. But you're always at the top of a hill. Every time they bump into you, you're always on the top of a hill. You're not at the bottom waiting for them. You've always marched up there. It depends a lot on the day. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a decent day, it's good to get out, isn't it? Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it, when it's a decent day? But like you say, bit of rain where you are today. Um, oh. Better stay inside. Uh, that's, that's the answer, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and MBE, you know, someone like yourself, Lake District, sheep farmer, MBE, what was it? What was that like when you got the call for that? Oh, I thought it was very nice, really, you know. It's nice to get a bit of recognition. Because, you know, a lot of the run I do, I do it, you know, for the benefit of others, like, you know, uh, if I can, I always have do it for a charity of some kind. And, uh, you know, it was just a nice honour to get, really. Like, you know, I enjoyed the day down at uh, the palace and uh, it was something just nice to look back on. Did, did you get to meet the Queen? I did. I, I, very what, what did you day. chat about? Well, I just, uh, it's very formal, like, you know, you just said a few words and that was it. There was nothing exciting. She didn't want to date with us out like that. <laughs> Philip would have been keeping his beady eyes on you back then, I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, how, how did that come about, though? Because, you know, is it purely that did someone have to nominate you? or did, did... I certainly must have nominated because, you know... We used to do quite a lot of runs in them days for, for charities. Like, we still do a lot for, you know, ch charity like young people who've uh, got mislaid in life. And uh, I think we started doing sponsored runs and that sort of thing. Like, you know, I think we did the first one to uh, finish scout camp in Enderdale, like, you know, at the very beginning. And then after that, uh, sponsored runs took off, like, you know. Yeah. And, and I mean, you actually you've got your own fell running challenge at minute, aren't you? The Lake Loon Challenge. Um, um, it's only open to over fifties, which I quite like that that thing. You know, none of these younger kids can go and do it. It's fifties and over only. I, man, we've got some good good over fifties, like you know. Uh, but yeah, the run of the male over fifties, they've got a you know, 
do quite a bit of training to, to do it in the time we allow them. But the front runners, they can do it, you know, quite nicely. But after, when they get to 55, they get another three hours, like, you know, we put it on for them to do. But the first age group is a challenge, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then after that, every five years, they get another five, another three hours till uh, when they're 65, they get 24 hours. Oh, so well, that's pretty good. I might wait till the 24-hour mark then because I'm not convinced uh, that I can do it in the 12. Uh, you know, when you're that age and everybody, who, you know, makes a hundred pound or more for a charity, they get a, a tankard, like, you know, which is a nice thing for them. They're coming out at the uh, presentation at evening and have a good crack and next morning take them for a walk and then wants to go. And uh, uh, it's just a nice setup, really. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, the, the 48 miles, about 70, 75, 76 kilometres, something like that, is it? Um, um, Pooley Bridge to Grendale Bridge, 30 summits, 17,000 feet of climbing. That's the that's, killer, isn't it? There's a bit of climbing in it. You know, it's, for the, you know, it, it's tougher than the Bob Graham for the 50-year-olds. Yeah. But after that, they get the more time to do it, you see. So when I get to 55, I'm going to get 15 hours to do it in. Is that right? That's it. Aye. And if you lengthen your stride, it takes a bit more of it. <laughs> lengthen my stride. I like that. Is that the secret to going faster then, to lengthen my stride? <laughs> It'll help. Especially if it's downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about going downhill, I've, I've seen an article that one of your legs is much bigger than the other because you use it to slow yourself down going downhill. Is that right? <laughs> to the ones naked. <laughs> it has been, you know, most of time really. It's, it has no cartilage in joint, you know. It's it just runs on bare bone. Do you have any injections or anything like that for it? I haven't yet. Now you've mentioned it, it might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Get some in there. <laughs> so, but so the best the best lubrication for joints, and um, I know you like it, is a pint of Guinness. Though, am I right in saying that? It's cured a lot of ailments. It, it still does cure a lot of ailments as well. I, I it's good stuff. I have a fair bit of Guinness on. Did, um, did Guinness never ever come to you to sponsor you? Because that would have been a cracking sponsorship deal for you. The, the bit tight ass of Guinness, they've never offered out yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a copy of this and say to him, you need to be getting sponsoring just on this. I've drunk Guinness for 80 years. It's a very long time. As a, has that changed over the years as well? I mean, cause I only drank Guinness recently, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, which it's always been the same. But I've heard uh, years ago it was a bit different. Uh, it was rather, mo, 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 it was slightly sharper, rather more a bit, bit, bit bitter taste. But say so then were bottle, bottle Guinness in them days, early days. And the draft Guinness now, it, you know, it's, if it, it's fairly much the same, whatever you drink it. Uh, in Kalani, it's somewhat special, and it's bloody expensive over there, so I don't go there to drink it. <laughs> Stay in the UK and then, and then drink it. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Um, no, I, I, I love the whole idea of, like, you know, um, running, drinking Guinness. That, that is, like, the perfect run for me, is, like, run to a pub, um, pint, run home, um, and things like that. But now, but in a pint of Guinness, have you better good run, put your feet up. But what's the toughest race you've ever done? What's the, been the hardest race? Oh, I think when I did the uh, Wayne race on the third day, I got me uh, ankles badly cut. I got a, you know, first pair of shoes dropped a bit, and uh, I couldn't get anything. You know, I should have had a bit taken off the tops because they cut, cut into my ligaments on the side of my ankles, and uh, they were that tender I couldn't couldn't run on them. I just had to walk and make the best of it. Wow. And what, what, what trainers did you use at the time? What, what brand of shoes were you using? Uh, I think the second pair, I, th I think they were maybe Walsh's second lot, but they were just a bit high on the sides. And, you know, we're doing a lot of contouring and that. They cut me ankles badly, like, you know. And if uh, Edmund for Barbara Nelson, the young lady who was, a sh you know, they should operate this or something like that. She come out most nights and patch them up, but you know, after about an hour or so, you know, you couldn't really run on them, though that painful. 
And I'm, I'm going to assume they were the Walsh PBs, the, the original Walsh ones, were they the blue ones? Because at that, that time, that was the only really fell running shoe out, wasn't it? I, but there probably would be, like, you know, because yeah. the USA were the only sort of running shoe there was. And what, what do you think to today's running shoes then with all the technology that goes behind them in terms of all this cushioning and the, the rebound effects and things like that? They're all right on a fine day if you're not contouring. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a lot of contouring to do and it's wet day like this, you'll end up walking on the sides most of them. You go down through Kirkfell Breast or something like that and they're wet, you end up walking on the sides of most of them. They lack a bit of stability. It, that's what you got with the Walsh's, wasn't you? Because the Walsh's were just literally, you know, I mean, I, I remember my very first pair, pair of Walsh PBs, you know, I was 18 year old and I was doing a, a little cross country run and someone decided to get me these and there's no cushion in it. It was just like a tractor tyre with oh, an upper I, on. I with no engine in them. Yeah. <laughs> we're now, you know, I look at trainers now and I, I am a bit of a, a trainer, I feel, I feel, is it, well, I'm a, not an expert, but I love my trainers. You know, I've got 30, 40 pairs um, yeah. of yeah, trainers. Pretty money then if you have 40 pairs. <laughs> I, I, I work all day. That's no, It's my only treat. I've got to work when I work every day. I've got to have a treat, haven't I? So I, um, I do treat myself. Oh, well, <laughs> if you get trained out to buy the shows. <laughs> I mean, they are expensive, but, you know, I guess I, I do a lot of running. I run every day. Um, so I guess it's my little treat sometimes, but... Well, that's you, right. If you get pleasure out of it, put, yeah. put your money in it. Yeah. I guess that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, that's what you did. You got you got pleasure out of it, and that's why you continue to do it and challenge yourself and push yourself. Oh, that's right. Aye. Do you still do any any running? I mean, you, I'm not going to tell everyone how young you are, but you know, you, you we're going to come to a little bit in a minute about doing fifty for fifty and sixty for sixty and that. But you know, do you still get out there and run now? I get out. I go for a walk most days. You know, I do the mountain trail and that sort of thing. Yeah, short of course in the mountain trail now. So I still do that. I've been doing them for sixty two years. Wow. <laughs> and and. I mean, well, let's, let's go talk about some of the, the milestones that you reached. So when you when you were 60 year old, you went and did 60 Wainwrights, is that right? The well, there were 60 peaks over two and a half thousand feet. Wow. There were 60 in the uh, Lake District. Then the Wendy Dodds one or two, I didn't want to since then. In the spare time, you've gone and put an extra 50 foot on one or two. <laughs> <laughs> is that we're building the cairns and that on the top is it is that they've built the extra distance on a bit of spare time they're going out in one or two and, and I, I hear that you've got a fan of building cairns well not really I've I've put one or two up high there's one at uh, on the book by the moss someone pulled down in the 60s about 1966 and uh, I rebuilt that in 2001, and uh, if people leave it alone, it'll stand forever. I, I like it when you go to the top of a peak. You know, some of them have got trigs on, so you know you've reached the top of one. But uh, not not all have got the trigs on, so I like it when there's a cairn there to tell me that I've reached it. You know, I, I, it, Well, it's sad because there used to be a good one on the top of Yewara and one on the top of uh, Lingmail, one on the top of High Crags or Black Crags, or whatever Wainwright called them. And the same person had built them all, and then someone pulled them down. And, you know, it was sad because the bloke who had put them up was a craftsman. You know, they were built and built properly. Yeah. You know, like the one on top of uh, Pale Head. You know, I don't know that one's still, still in, you know, but they're built and well built, like. And... Uh, that one on the moss, somebody pulled it down at the same time, but I don't think it was the same person, like, because this fellow did a bit, a bit of a bloody old mischief for pull that one down. Mm. He's with us no longer, like, you know. And uh, I decided it, it should be built because it was built for a purpose. And uh, I never found out why it was built, but one chap told me that someone had told him they'd found a body there, you know, in the, I don't know, later part of the... Uh, 19th century or something like that 
but you never know, do you? No, no, you don't, do you? You know, but, but the great the great markers out of these cairns, the absolutely amazing markers for us, for us who go up on the peaks. I well, listen in on the top, like it's just on the on this moss. On right. the moss, but when you're going down the lake side between Smittybeck Fall and the guidepost, you can look up and see it on the skyline. And, uh, you know, a lot of people get a lot of pleasure out of just going and have a look at it and just sit there and have the bait and walk back down. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, if you get pleasure out of it, and it's what it was built for. Yeah. Yeah, too right. Too right. O -o over the years, you know, you're talking about over the years how things have happened. What's it been like living in the Lake District and seeing how the Lake Districts flourish? Because it was always been a bit of a, a running mecca for as long as long as I can remember. But literally over the last 15, 20 years, it's flourished into this into the, the world mecca of running, of fell running, hasn't it? Uh, you know, it's not the running side that's done the damage. There's no facilities been made for the people who's coming in any, any longer. Like in what's led, it's just the same as it was, more or less, at the beginning. Apart from there's a little campsite down at the top end of the lake and there's a, a, a car park there. Like I said, about 50 years ago, I wanted them to put a great big car park in on this area where the river's destroyed, like, you know, over the years. It took five or 600 cars and they could put a, a big toilet block in there and it would have solved what's led's problem. Uh, and they won't listen to any locals. They won't the National Trust. Right. You're just wasting your time going to the meeting with them. I know I tried for years and I give up. And there was another gentleman called David Killick. He tried for his lifetime to get them to do things. And they promised them they were going to do the toilets and that it was lead. And he thought he'd done a good job. Uh, but it, they've never been done yet. No. It's disgusting in this day and age. And so what we're saying is that although we've got this, we've got a massive influx of people going there, the facilities are not right then. Is that what we're saying? That, the, you know, there needs to be some investment? Yeah, the man who should be on a box outside White Hall. <laughs> <laughs> you should be on the box outside White Hall. Everyone would follow you down there. <laughs> you... Over the years, some people have, have talked about you in some great lights. You know, I mean, like I said, I've mentioned earlier on when we were talking that there's been a lot of documentaries made about you, you know, and, and films made about you and that. But, I mean, one of the things I found out, Chris Brasser, you know, London Marathon fame, you know, great runner back then, he oh, called I, you the best ever. I knew what he was talking about, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he did, didn't he? <laughs> But what's it like when, you know, you look back and you think some of these great people, you know, because you never went to the, you know, you're not an Olympian, you know, you never went and made mainstream running. You stayed true to your roots. You know, you straight st stayed true to the fell running, to the, the underground side of running, the ones uh, where people do it for pleasure rather than for um, fame. That's it. I, I just one of them things, I was at the wrong spot at the wrong time. And, uh, you know, I've been injured most of my life. Or oh, oh, working on the farm. Uh, I know. Well, that's it. When you're a one-man band, you're a one-man band. <laughs> yeah, I got to get that. I mean, what, what's... I've been told that you now spend a little bit of time in Spain in the summer, in the winter, is that right? In the winter, well, I did, but I think Brexit's tried to knock out that. You know, you can only go for three months now. And, uh, you know, I had a home and that out there and, you know, the setbacks in life, I've lost it all, you know, with Mrs. Got Dementia, you know, and it, things went sadly wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I've had five years of hell I wouldn't wish on anybody, but, you know, that's life. I and mean, you've just got to rebuild yourself and go forward. You have. And, and, you, and you're one of those type of people that's always faced challenges in life and overcome them and, and moved on and... Um, you're from what I would call the old school world. You know, you're very much like um, my father was. You know, when things when things go wrong, you you pick yourself up and move on. And you know, like you said there, when you were you did the Wainwrights, and you know, you're three days into it, your ankle goes. You, rather than quit, you just carried on going. That's it. Uh, when you start, somebody finish it. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, that's absolutely amazing. You know, fantastic to you there. So what's what's next for Josh Taylor? You know, we're coming up to a milestone in age soon. Are we going to go for more peaks or? Well, we'll just have a quiet walk. <laughs> we'll just have a quiet walk. <laughs> I was expecting to tell us to say, let's go for 86 at 86. <laughs> I uh, we might we might do that, but we one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so when when's the next? What's the next big thing for you? Because I know you're working quite heavily with the youngsters up there, aren't you? You know, going and tending up quite a few um, schools and things like that. I've seen in the um, is the Advent magazine um, and that that you've been to a few schools and and that the Westmoreland Gazette. Uh, what we do now we raise money for Brady. Brady at uh, Ambleside. Right. Okay. That's actually where they are. Uh, they've got a big uh, place there where they take the uh, youth. I don't tell the youth out of this country, but from backward areas that's maybe gone rather wrong in life and put them out there with new way of thinking. They turn about uh, well over 70% of these young people's lives around and they become natural human beings which is a great thing. And uh, I've been involved with them for this last 15 years and uh, try to make a bother to them to keep the place going because a lot of them kids who go there, they're from deprived areas. And uh, I've also put a book together, you know, for the proceeds of that to go to Brady. And uh, it's come out about a month ago. And, uh, you know, it's going quite well at the moment. And what's it called? It's called uh, the Lakes, Mayors and Waters. It's a runner did in the Lake District. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's just a lovely thing to do. It's about, I think about nearly 40 years ago I did that run. And we wrote a book on it. And it's a lovely book. It's got some fantastic photographs in. It's well documented. And it's well worth anybody putting their hand in the pocket and buying a, a copy. Because... It's going to a good cause for turning young people's lives around and uh, ready to do a great job with their proceeds. Fantastic. Um, I, you've, you've sold it to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go straight after this has ended. I'm going online and buying this book. I buy one for all your mates as well. <laughs> <laughs> if I go and buy my mates, I'm not going to get no shoes this month. <laughs> <laughs> I will. You can always, you can always do a Alex and go barefooted. <laughs> Oh, that barefoot running, that is... Have you ever tried that, Joss? <laughs> Just downstairs running with it, downstairs. I, I once tried it, it's not for me. I don't get this barefoot running. Like, I can always remember that there was this old monk. It was in uh, Steve Peaks in Yorkshire. He was sitting medicated, and uh, I interviewed him. I said, what are you going to do today then, Mike, you know? He said, I'm doing the three peaks barefooted. <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you something, mister, if you put a pair of bloody shoes, you'll enjoy it better. Oh. He only got about top of, I think, top of uh, Wernside or somewhere, and they dropped out. Yeah. He's doing the three peaks barefooted. I don't get I know years ago Zola Bud did it in the Olympics, but she was running on a track, you know, and, and, and roads and that. But no, I don't get the barefoot running at all. No, no, you're far better uh, put a pair of shoes on. Yeah, and it's quite big in the States. You know, I've, I've, I've seen quite a lot of people that I follow in, in America running oh. trails in barefoot and that, but they have snakes over there. Oh, you know, that's right. wrong. Uh, we've got one in the Lake District, right? Alex, and, you know, but they've got to do a lot of groundwork before they can do it. Yeah. You know, they can't just go barefoot and do things like that. Uh, you know, the uh, and the feet become like bloody paddy feet. You know, they'll spread more, and they'll have a job wearing shoes properly after. Yeah, the long the yeah. long term implications are not good for them, is what we're saying. No, and they're not. No, no. They thought I better invest in a pair of shoes. <laughs> um, I'm going to let you go in a minute, Josh. But there's one thing: every picture I always see of you. You know, and we're talking here on Zoom, and my my listeners can't see this, but you always put one leg over the armchair. What's with that? Because you know, I think it's great. It's your natural pose, but but what is it? Is it something you've always done? 
It is. It's the best red relax. So we lean back and one leg over the over the armchair. I uh, then when you're that bit tired, <laughs> the other up. <laughs> <laughs> Swap them over. <laughs> Fantastic. Joss, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining me today. So there you go, Joss Naylor. Ended a bit abrupt that, didn't it? <laughs> I'll tell you the reason why. It's because when I said that to him, it just hung up on me. Bless him. <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Absolutely amazing. Um, so there we go, Joss Naylor. Uh, so we've got coming up, special edition of Who's Hot this week. We're going to announce the winners of the UK OCR series uh prediction competition and we're going to send them out a, a beanie at in the this week we're also at the end of the who's up podcast i've got some interviews with some of the winners and podium places and some of the other runners that attended at the weekend so i'm going to put them on tomorrow i'm going to put them tomorrow say so wednesday sorry wednesday and um, when who's up comes out so listen to who's up uh if we've not mentioned you you're going to get your, your mention name out on wednesday um in the meantime um, oh, if you want to, if you want to advertise, I keep forgetting about this. If you want to advertise, get in touch, get in touch, please get in touch. Um, we do need some advertisements. We do need to start making a little bit of money um, to cover us costs. Um, yeah, my wife's going to probably divorce me if she keeps seeing them bills popping in for everything that that keeps coming up. But there you go. That's just the way it is, isn't it? I hope she doesn't divorce me. I don't want to divorce me. But yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, do that. Don't forget, follow us other podcasts and keep an eye out for everything that we do. Follow YouTube, follow UK OCR TV. We're going to have a video coming out, like I say, um, Total Warrior. But in the meantime, thank you for listening, guys and girls. Um, I love you all. You all take care, and I'll speak soon. Bye. Try